But one of the things that came up this week, and I thought I'd talk about it for a little bit, because we, we live in a world of um, paradoxes. In the kingdom of God, it's full of paradoxes. And this last week on the Monday, I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a bunch of the paradoxes of the kingdom of heaven because, because there's a bunch of people here in this camp who don't know me, and I don't want to take five days for them to warm up to me. You know, I don't want to, because I, I want to say, I want to be able to say what I feel the Lord wants me to say without being analyzed, right? Without being, well, let's see if he's, his theology is okay. That can take, that can take, never mind five days, that could take years for us to be, you know, be, feel safe enough with people. So I started throwing out some of the paradoxes because, because these are the things that, that, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just being careful to guard my words, but we stumble over. We stumble over certain things. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this one here, the rest of God. You know, that sometimes we think, oh, I'm pursuing the rest of God. Jesus said, come unto me, you that are heavy, heavy laden and, and, uh, and weary, and I will give you rest. Right? Isn't that a great promise? God is going to give us rest. He's going to give us uh, comfort to our souls, and he's going to free us up. But do you know how you get that? The Bible says labor to enter into his rest. <laughs> I mean, if that isn't a paradox, he's, okay, I need to labor to get to the place where I don't labor anymore. Yes. <laughs> well, how do you do that? <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. How do you do that? Exactly. This is, this is a part of the mystery and the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. If, if it was that easy, God would just lay it out for it. But he wants you to find the treasure. See, God has created this filtering system. He's created this, this, uh, this, uh, these layers and layers of access and at the same time resistance so that we, we must do things to find the secret of what gets us through. And, you know, you can sit back and say, well, what's the secret? Faith. What's the secret? Loving God. Yes, but having faith and loving God is not as easy as to think. And it's, it, it's more than I be, saying I believe. It's more than saying the right songs. It's more than saying, Jesus, I love you. Because as we know, there are many times when we say we love him, but we love our sin also. So God is actually prepared. Father, right now, I just say in Jesus' name, I, in Jesus' name, I can, I can feel that spirit, that religious spirit that's, that's coming and trying to, you see, there, there's a warfare against setting our course to the king, setting our plotted line before him. And the enemy tries to say, no, 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 there's nothing you need to do because Jesus is taking care of it. Yes, Jesus is taking care of it, but you still have to overcome your unbelief. I mean, the fact that God has done these things is fine, but unless you're getting him to pay your way, you're not getting the benefit of that. So there's this duality so we get caught sometimes between shame and then between, you know, well, I don't have to do anything. And anybody who says I have to do something, that's just legalism. So one of the other things I hit this week, I was talking about worship because I, I, I discerned. <laughs> I felt like there was, this, there was this attitude, and it's in the church everywhere. And it's attitude that, that we can just sit back and enjoy the presence of God and that, that there's no need to reach for anything. There's no need to contend for anything. And, and uh, that contending for something is the, is the evidence that you're not in faith. But here's the problem. We're not overcoming God's reluctance. Now, you've heard me say this before. We're not overcoming. When we're worshiping, it's not that God is unwilling to receive us. What is the problem then? The problem is we're unwilling to go. Paul said this. He said, in my flesh, that, you know, in me, that is in my flesh, no good thing dwells. There's, there's something in me that's literally hostile to God. So that means this, is that, is that when, you, when you are trying to advance into the presence of God, there's something there, and it's not God 
that's hindering you. So I gave this example a number of years, and you've heard it before, but, you know, the Challenger jet or whatever. Is that the one that blew up, the Challenger? Okay, not that one. What's the name of some of the other ones? Apollo, Apollo yeah. When they're, when they're leaving the earth, right, and you have those rockets are going off, those, they need that strength. They need that force propelling them into the sky, not because space is unwilling to receive them. Space is plenty willing for you to come. The door is open. There's literally, from the, from the perspective of space, there's nothing in space that's keeping you from coming into it. All the power that's resisting is on the earth. It's, it's the gravitational pull that keeps you from leaving the orbit of the earth. Similarly, God is inviting us to ascend into something, and nothing in heaven is literally resisting. It's the things on earth that are, that are pulling. The gravitational pull have an attachment to something, and it yanks on it. And so our journey is get rid of those things. Get rid of those things. If you could just get rid of those things, it's like security at the airport. You're going through in a beep, 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 beep. Yeah, you know, take off your belt. If you could take off your belt and take those coins out of your pocket and get rid of those nail clippers, then you can pass through. Heaven is not reluctant, but heaven has created uh, a criteria for who can ascend and who, can, who cannot ascend. Thank you, Lord. But in the context of this... Uh, that, those are just a couple of the, the, the paradoxes. But Brent was beginning to share about some things, and I want to read a couple of scriptures. The first one is Matthew 28, 18. I think you guys are all well aware of this one. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the ends of the earth. Wow, that's a great passage. And so this was the message that Brent was bringing, and it's a message that I, 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 I ascribe to totally, which is this. The kingdom of darkness, its power has been broken. It's power, like, like, like you don't need to do anything else to break the power and the authority of the kingdom of darkness. Its power is broken over you, all right? And that's true. That's exactly true. There's, there's nothing else that you need to do to enhance your authority as a believer. But what you need to do is to empty yourself of those things that he has authority over. All right, that you know what we have is we have things in us that he has authority over. He is called the father of liars, the father of lies. You know, uh, Leviathan is called the the prince of pride. That means that means that uh, wherever there is a tendency or a nature to lie, there is the dominion of the kingdom of darkness. And so what's the antidote for that? Well, I want to get a spirit of the love of the truth. And as I love the truth, I start to actually, actually start to hate deception. And when I hate deception and love the truth, then there, then there ceases to be any handles in my life that the enemy can get a hold of. And that's how I step into the authority and the freedom that has been provided for me by Jesus. Basically, the, God is saying, listen... Anything that is not uh, uh, that that does not belong to me needs to be in, divested from your lives. And when you do that, when you do that, you have freedom. Nothing that holds you back. Nothing that holds you back is connected to light or life. And so we're on this journey where God is saying to us. Hey, listen, I'd like you to come up a level, but as you can see, you're stuck right now. I and mean, I think there's some people that feel stuck, and I want to say this to you. You're not stuck forever. You're not stuck because God is angry. You're not stuck because God has rejected you. You're not stuck because God is disappointed with you and he's punishing you. 
<laughs> right, we got to get rid of that. That whole mindset that there is a vindictive dog, God who relishes uh, our inability to ascend, that somehow it's like, it's like, well, that'll teach you. No, his heart is, listen, no, come up, come on. If you could just let go of that thing. You know, it's the old picture of the monkey who, who won't let go of the, the banana. He's stuck, and the hunter comes along and just clubs him because he won't let go of the banana. It's like, I want to have the banana and freedom. He said, no, you can either choose one or the other. Captivity or freedom is within your purview. You got to let go of the banana. But there's an invitation. Thank you, Lord. I just feel the beauty of that invitation. The, the Lord is saying, I'm actually looking for you. I, I actually have more authority, more positions, more roles, more, more gatekeeping, you know, openings, more, more things, more opportunity, more, more uh, promises, more provision, more resources than can possibly be grasped by the present population of the entire world. Such is the span and the greatness of the kingdom of God. So God is actually looking for more. He's not rejoicing in the fact that we don't step into these things. He's wanting us to step into them. Father, I pray we'll realize that you are not against us. And this is the mindset that we have sometimes, like, oh, you know, God is, God is restricting me because da, 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 da. No, he'd be happy. Just let it go. Just turn. But the problem is it takes us forever to turn. And that's, that's, a, that's a me issue. That's not a him issue. So the word he uses here when he says all authority has been given to me is the word exousia. And so I thought, oh, you know, I'll, I'll demonstrate my knowledge of Greek by copying and pasting this. <laughs> this is the extent of my Greek knowledge. I can copy and paste. But so I knew that this word clearly, literally means authority, but it actually has nuances that are more specific to that. And this is what it says. It literally means it is permissible. It is allowed. Permission, authority, right, liberty. And the thing with, with you have a right, and this is why, what people don't understand, but, you know, all authority has been given to me. And they'll quote, they'll quote uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. You know, authority has been given to tread upon serpents and scorpions. That means this. That means you have the right to. You have permission. You have access to everything that will enable you to do that. But there's still a big question mark. And the big question mark is, are you doing it? Not can you, not do you have a right, not is it done. It's totally done. You know, when, when you give, are given a piece of land, you own that land, but the coyotes still come on. Like, what's the matter with them? Can't they read? It says no trespassing. You know, at some point, there are forces that don't, don't respond to your intelligent plight requests. And so they have to be forced. And the question is, do you know how to force demonic powers to come into alignment? Do you know how to do that? It's, it's one thing to know, well, you can quote to them all the scripture. Well, you've already been conquered. <laughs> Evidently not, they say. You have to enforce that conquering. That's what we're here for. Through the church, the manifold wisdom is being made known to principalities and powers. It's not God that is resisting. It's not God that is against our peace. It's not God that is, that is uh, uh, unwilling to have us walk in the resources of heaven. It's all on us to just do it. And so what, for that, what we need is an atmosphere where we're free to venture, where we're free to try. You know, this week we were up in the camp and we had a situation where somebody was walking around prophesying over people uh, very poorly. And uh, we knew at least two occasions where somebody had given a prophetic word, the same person. And they, they started their prophetic word by saying, I never do this. <laughs> but 
And the, the words were totally out to lunch. And, uh, and so I had to get up and give a little exhortation on how to, how to acknowledge, recognize a word from the Lord and what to do with a word that may or may not be uh, obedience worthy. And so, but, but here's the thing. My concern was this. My concern was there might be a bunch of people in the crowd who will think, well, you know, uh, how, how is it that we, we should even, even, how can you even get it wrong if you're doing it in the name of the Lord? Like, like shouldn't it be always perfect? And, and I, I didn't have time to explain it, but no, because what we're doing is we're practicing. Do you know that we're practicing? You know, the Bible doesn't say prophesy perfectly. It says prophesy according to your faith. Prophesy according to your faith. Well, you might get that wrong in the same way you pray prayers that you're hoping have faith, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> sometimes they're just hopes, right? And so we're on a, a trial and discovery process. You, you hear somebody pray a prayer, and you see something happen from that prayer, you think, wow, I want to do that. But then it's like when it's your turn to do it, it's one thing to stand next to them and say, yes, Amen. But when you're the guy doing it, that's risky. We want to create an atmosphere where you can risk and not feel condemned if you don't actually quite cross the finish line. See, we love, the church loves polish. The church loves success. The church loves those that do it well. So we've created a culture where everybody sits and watches the ones who do it well and applauds. I mean, God is saying, no, I don't, I don't want you re rejoicing over those ones that are a little bit ahead of you in the journey. I want you to follow them into the journey. Yeah. Anyway, I was, uh, so I was, I was sharing about this pr prophetic word. And I said, listen, don't hate people. Don't despise prophecy just because somebody got it wrong. And now in this case, it was quite aberrant. And if we, that person, they weren't there by that time, and had they remained around, we would have explicitly told them, you may not prophesy over people. But we had to share it because we thought, you know, I don't know how many people here have already gotten a prophetic word. And it was quite directive. It's like, you know, do this or God is going to kill you, kind of <laughs> almost at that level. <laughs> so, you know, um, not quite in those words, but it was uh, very directive. And so, um, so, yeah. But we have this invitation. We have an invitation from the Lord. We have an invitation to come up higher. We have an invitation to step into a realm. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. This invitation exists. And there's this story that Jesus tells about the wedding feast. And how the, the father is sending out these invitations. And he said, he said, not enough people are responding to the invitation. Right now, an invitation is made, being made to the body of Christ. Step into this realm. Step into your place. Rise up. Begin, begin to, to realize what it is you have. You know, apply yourself to this stuff. But it seems like it's going over the heads of many of us. And the Lord is saying, listen, if you don't do it, I'm going to broaden the scope of this invitation. I'm going to go and send people into the highways and byways, and are go I'm going to invite them to participate in this thing. Because I will have a people who do exactly what I want them to do. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want some brand new green behind the ears Christian sitting in my seat in heaven. Just because I was unwilling to do what the Lord wanted. So I was enjoying what these other speakers were bringing this week and it challenged me. Because, you know, and I want to confess this to you because sometimes I, we think, well, you know, if you see somebody who's walking in something, you're not, they, they must be completely happy. And I am happy with what I have, but I know that there's more. Yeah. I know there's more. When I say there's more, I'm not just saying it to move you guys. I'm saying it because this is, 
This is what drives me. I don't want to fall short of the things that have been provided for me. I don't want to fall short of my mandate. I don't want to miss the opportunities that God has given me. I'm actually leaning into God, saying, God, you know, Lord, I want to hear your voice very clearly. I have a number of decisions before me today, this very day, about things that I need to, need to do or not do in the next few weeks even. And, and, uh, and I need wisdom. And I, don't, I feel like I'm not even hearing correctly. I feel like I'm not even, I don't even have that clarity of mind. So it, there's no shame in looking for more clarity. There's no shame for leaning in. There's no shame in taking time to fast and pray, realizing I don't want to be so dull in my understanding. I mean, I love this story when Bob Jones says to, to uh, uh, Mike Bickle. Yeah, Mike Bickle. He's prophesying to Mike Bickle. We all know who Mike Bickle is, right? He's a global leader at IHOP, you know, International House of Prayer. I mean, millions of people have tuned in and watched and joined the prayer, been there as prayer missionaries. And Bob Jones is saying to him, well, you know, do you like to pray? Do you like Israel? Do you like all these things? He said, I see you. I see you uh, doing this and that and the other thing. And he says, do you, do you, know, do you understand anything I'm talking about? He says, no. And he says, well, I knew you were going to be dull, but I didn't know you would be this dull. <laughs> I want to say this today. I'm duller. I hear less clearly than I want to. I see less clearly than I want to. I know less than I want to know. I want to have with precision an ability to administrate the kingdom of heaven on earth. I'm asking the Lord for how do, how do you cause miracles to happen? I am done waiting and thinking that, well, if God really wants to do this, he would do it. That's not how it works. If God's will was automatically being, being done, he wouldn't have told us, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Why do we have to contend for the will of God to be done if it's all, all automatic? This notion of sovereignty means everything God wants immediately happens is false. No, the sovereignty of God means that ultimately the will of God will be completely done. But it's being done by a people who come into alignment with him. That what he prophesies about moments, eclipsing moments where the glory of God dominates the earth. The earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. It's a moment of convergence when the people he's called to do it suddenly wake up in a generation and become what he called the generation of Jacob. They suddenly realize, no, it's not just going to be done automatically. It's going to be done because of people believe and step into a moment. And then suddenly that's the moment that God saw and he prophesied about. Does that make sense? So the question is, what does God want me to do today to step into that? Am I willing to take responsibility for it? Now, this morning I had a challenge. What time is it? I'll go five more minutes. Then you can get out early. Now, we, we're probably going to get the band to come up and sing a song. and let's, we'll, we'll spend a little time in the presence of the Lord. But I have a challenge. I have a challenge. My challenge is this. I want to, to be glory fire in here on Sunday mornings. Yeah. But I, I understand how this works. And we're not going to get fire unless somebody makes it. Yeah. And maybe, you know, we, ne we, ne we, never, uh, we never grew up in, in uh, houses without furnaces and central heating and all of that. But it used to be that that's the way it worked. Wendy's father, her, their, her, his responsibility, him and his sister, was to go across the street and start the fire for the schoolhouse so that when the other kids show up, there would be warmth. There would actually be an atmosphere that, that was not deathly to them, right? And so we're so used to things being done for us in church, but things are being done for us because somebody's doing them. When we come in, and you experience the presence of God. If you weren't the one that was actively accessing it, then somebody else did it for you. 
Those toasts that were made this morning by moms, you know, and put butter and jam on it, that didn't, you know, that, that didn't come out of the fridge like that. Somebody actually did that. And the trajectory of growth is one day you will do that yourself. But God is calling us. We need a cross-section of people in the body of Christ across Canada to step into the fray. We have far too many people waiting on God to do something because it was prophesied where God is saying, no, I need you to believe the word and step in and step out as though you believe it to be true. I need you to realize you actually have authority to make this happen. You can't just sit back lackadaisically and hope that somebody else is going to do it. Because I believe this, that if the body of Christ will really step into this moment, we could shift Canada. We could shift Canada. Within months, we could shift Canada. And it is a, a blinding lethargy that says that, that no, this, the kingdom of God is something God is doing. No, the kingdom of God is not something God is doing. We have permission to advance the kingdom of God. And we either do it or we don't. And so this morning, and I, I referenced it, a lot of the people that, that often are at the forefront and pushing weren't here. And so that meant there was, more, there was more weight having to be carried by those that were here. But if we're not being accustomed to going across the street and lighting the schoolhouse fire, chances are it might not get done. In fact, even right now, uh, there's, there is a, a struggle in the atmosphere. And when Jesus went to, to his hometown, he couldn't do mighty miracles. Did you hear that? Jesus could not do mighty miracles. Was he the same guy? Yeah, he was the same guy. But it doesn't work that way. He couldn't do the miracles because the people didn't believe. And so his, his ministry is, if I could create faith in the people, if I can, if we can find people that are willing to receive the word of God and be changed and start to believe, then what we can do in this world will increase. But it's not doing it singularly alone. It is something that the body rises into. It's like trying to fly a kite with no wind. You can't fly a kite with no wind. And there are things... I mean, this is it, guys. The very greatest moments that we will ever experience, it might come a year from now. Your greatest breakthrough might come a year from now or a month from now or a week from now, but you could have had it today. That's the reality. Well, isn't God deciding? No, God isn't deciding. You're deciding. I, mean, I know for some that's too much guilt, too much responsibility. All right? So then just wait longer. But when we were in North Battleford a few years ago, and this old gentleman who was there when the outpouring came, he talked about the electric presence. He said it was, it was beyond comprehension. We heard angels singing with our ears. The, the intensity of the presence of God that started to fall down was absolutely, stunningly amazing. I was just in Ottawa with a guy who was, who was in contact with a, an, um, an AOG guy from the US, United States who's chronicling all the testimonies from the latter rain, which the Pentecostal churches rejected in 1948. But now they're pursuing them and they're studying them and they're find, trying to find out. There was a place in Alberta where people were falling under, under the power of God. And so many people were falling that they started to stack on another and they began floating. Here in Alberta, floating in the air instead of falling to the ground. I'd like to see some of that. And I don't want to do it because I have to wait longer. I like to be caught up to heaven. I like to see, I just was watching this story of A.A. A. Allen, how he, he, he saw a miracle of a child with 26 diseases healed. Anybody see that video? Look at it. 26 diseases. And there came a point where the, had, the child had clubs for feet, no feet. It was deformed and its arms were like this. Its tongue couldn't, was dangling out of their mouth. I mean, 26 different diseases. And the first one that, that, that was healed was the tongue. It just snapped in like a rubber band. 
But then there began to be the sound of crackling and popping as the bones were being healed. The, the blind eyes started to change and feet formed where there was clubs. Right in front of them. Right in front of them. I like to see that. I like to see that. But I'm caught in this like, I don't know how to do that. But on the other side, God says it's available. But I don't know how to do that. And God says, but it's available. I, but I don't know how to do that. And I'm afraid to try and not get it right. It's a lot easier to just do what I, what I know I can do. What if we could create a community of people who are willing to venture and not mock those who don't make it all the way to the finish line? But getting back to this man, so he's describing these things. And in his summary of this, and I've shared this before, I know, but I'll finish with this. He said, this is what we realized, that it was not them and then, but us and now. In other words, our mindset was always revival, breakthrough, glory, was something you read about in books. It's something that happened there and with an, another group of people. It, it, it's, it's, it's them and then. It's in Africa. It's in the Philippines. It's, it's, it's in another era. It's in the Scottish Isles uh, 200 years ago. It's, it's, it's in the Bible. It's another people, another time, because that's what God wills. But he said, well, we realized it was not them and them. In other words, God wasn't determining that it was only these people and only this time. But it, he said it was us and now. And he, which made it, meant this, said it was always available. We just didn't know it. It was always right in front of our noses. We just couldn't see it. So I'm asking the Lord for myself. No excuses. No excuses. God, what you're doing with others, you can do with me. Can you, let's say that together. What you're doing with others, you can do with me. What you've given to others, you can give to me. What you're doing with others, you can do with us. Father, we set ourselves today and we say, God, create the conditions in my life that I can start walking in the promises. Yes. Create the conditions in my life that the things that we've longed for would start to happen in us. Listen, this is not just something for the people who stand in the stage. We want to create an atmosphere of faith here because where we go, we go together. Where we're going, we're going together. And there might be some people that seem to have more authority, more power, and more of an important role in running this church. But let me tell you, where we go, we go together. Yes. Your faith determines where we go as a people. Yes. Can I have the worship team come up? Let's choose a good song to sing. Let's stand, let's stand up together. Let's just remind ourselves of what we said in the beginning. We're not going to go to shame. We're not going to go to guilt. We're not going to examine the lacks in our life and feel bad about it. No amens there? We're not going to go to guilt. We're not going to go to shame. We're not going to condemn ourselves for what we don't have. But we're done waiting. We're done waiting. God, show me how to pray the prayer of faith so that headaches disappear from my babies. Lord, show me how to pray the prayer of faith so that I can walk in constant victory. Show me how to wake up in the morning, Lord, with, a, with victory on my lips. Show me how to make it through a Sunday morning with kids doing things they shouldn't do with a husband or a wife not responding to, to what, you know, the, the, the sense of urgency I have to get to church. Lord, deal with what it causes me to be lethargic and I'm unable to motivate myself to be there on time to cause a breakthrough. We need to decide that next Sunday, next Wednesday, whatever meeting there is, we are going to be the ones who cause the breakthrough. We're going, to be, we're going to show up with faith. We're going to show up with worship. We're going to show up eager and hungry. 
I don't want to be pulled along reluctantly by another generation that just got saved last week. Did you hear me? I don't want to be pulled along by people who have only been saved a couple of months. I don't want to be the reluctant ones. I don't want to be the ones that say, well, you know, I've got a pretty good life. I'm pretty moral. It's not enough. It's not enough. God says, I want to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Who's going to run with me? Who's going to run after me? Who's setting their, their vision on the promise? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. On earth as it is in heaven.